How are you all doing? Good. Good. How are you? I'm well, thank you for asking. So um, thanks for coming for our guest speaker today. Uh, this is a, a FIA alumnus, Billy Bramer from Cohort 4. He was one of our programmers. And uh, he's come to join us. As you can see from his uh, opening slide, he has been at Epic, and he's had a couple of stops along the way as well. I know his boss, Jason, is watching. Hi, Jason. <laughs> if he says anything offensive, don't sue us. <laughs> I know his father, Bill, is watching as well, Bill Sr. So. Hi, Mr. Bramer. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, all the FIA alumni watching, hi. Hope you guys are well. And so um, we're going to see him talk about his experience. He's now a lead gameplay, uh, lead programmer uh, in gameplay at Epic. So he'll be taking over for Tim Sweeney whenever Tim Sweeney decides to step, step down. That, that's not going to be long. Oh, Billy is rising quickly. So uh, we're very proud of what he has done. So please welcome Billy Bramer. Thank you very much. I am super excited to be here. I would love to come back. It's been, it's been a while. Uh, so my talk today is to say, this is from Fire to Fortnite, my industry adventure. And so, you know, kind of go through the stuff that I've gone through and some things that I've learned. Um, disclaimer up front, Epic knows I'm here, of course, and I have permission, but I have to say, like, all opinions are expressed are my own and do not represent Epic Games or perhaps any of the other companies mentioned today. So, if I get in trouble, it's my fault. So, basically, that's, that's what we're doing here. The other disclaimer is, so I bought this clicker because I happened to watch some of the other alumni, and they had one, and I got jealous. And I've never done a presentation with a clicker before. And so, kind of like the great power comes great responsibility thing, I'm not convinced I'm responsible enough to have one. So, I might mess this up a few times, but we'll see. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, for me, well, first, what, who am I? Well, I went to UCF for undergrad, did uh, computer science, then I continued here, cohort four, as Ron said. We, we worked on an RTS style game called Bizarre Craft. I helped pitch the idea for it with my roommate Max, and I was the lead programmer on it. I think ultimately it ended up turning out not quite how any of us expected. But at the end of the day, we finished it, we completed it, and no one can take that away from us. So, you know, pretty proud of that we were able to get it done. Uh, what are we going to talk about specifically today? It's kind of easier to go over what we're not going to talk about. So, it's not laser focused. Now, I watched a lot of the alumni talks, and they had all this awesome data, and they like really great things about making mobile games and stuff, and I love their talk. But unfortunately, you're not going to get anything like that for me today. So, you know, Ron asked if I could come by, and I was in the area, and I was like, sure. And I agree without actually thinking maybe kind of a topic to talk about. So, <laughs> so kind of had to do it a little on the fly, but we're mostly going to go over you know, the stuff that I've learned and see how it goes. It's not well rehearsed. Uh, I, love, I love doing presentations, but that normally entails that I practice in front of a mirror talking to myself for like 60 hours. But a weird combination of illness and work means no, no rehearsal happens this time. So we're going we're gonna to play it by the seat of our pants and see what happens. May not always be coherent. I did this. <laughs> I did this when I had a flu. So some of this I might have thought was hilarious. And then we're gonna get there and we're like, wow, okay, you were in a flu haze. I'm not actually sure what happened right there. So this can be a two-way discussion. If I say something utterly stupid or I confuse you or you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can interrupt me in the middle, that's fine. Like we'll we'll talk about it and we'll we'll try get through this together. Uh, so instead, what you're gonna get is Proch of the Old Man story. <laughs> and like all cross the old man stories, there's going to be a basis of like, that's pretty common sense, but maybe there's a nugget of truth that you can really pay attention to there. And we're going to detail my slow little jalopy journey across the country and see what I learned along the way. And so we're going to start by, and as I was just telling Ron and Tom, the first lesson I learned is finding a high resolution logo, a spy logo, is virtually impossible. <laughs> So that's, that's what you get. Um, the thing I want to emphasize here, though, is I loved my time at Fire, and it pretty much effectively changed my life in almost every way. Like, professionally, I became a better programmer. Socially, personally, like, I learned how to interact with people better. And so I think it's really important that as students here that you learn a lot of the lessons that you would learn at Fire on your own, and so that's part of the experience. But there are certainly some that the faculty will emphasize to you and maybe it'll be like, yeah, sure, or whatever, right? And so I just want to go over a couple as an outside voice of like, hey, they actually know what they're talking about. Like, maybe you should listen. Or things that if you didn't learn until after you left, you'd be really sad. 
So, but that's it. Make the most of your time here. Do whatever you can, experiment, have all kinds of fun, practice anything you want, learn all different things. And in particular, like when you're doing prototypes, if you have a crazy game plan mechanic idea, like this is never going to work, just try it. Because when you get in the industry, you're not always going to be able to do that. And I know that they've stressed this multiple times, but like the industry is kind of a rough place. And the cost of a failed experiment in the industry could be that your doors close. And so this is a website that a coworker showed me called GameJobWatch.com if you want. And if you like look up in the corner, 3,375 game jobs lost so far this year alone. And they had to put a plus because they can only use publicly reported numbers that people have disclosed, and a lot of times they don't. So if you go to this website and look at the list, there's a lot of them that in this number column just says question mark, question mark, I don't know. So that number is actually probably much larger. And I think layoffs just happened last week again that they haven't updated yet to reflect. So the point is, do what you want to do now. Get the experiment out of the way. Where the worst case penalty is maybe Ron looks at you a little funny when you did something totally silly, right? <laughs> and so, you definitely want to make advantage of that time. Second, interdisciplinary skills are invaluable. And so I'm just going to be blunt and say it. If you are here and a student and you are not making an effort to pick up other discipline skills, you are doing it wrong. Like you need to really consider that and think what you can do to try to do that. Because the thing is, a little bit actually goes a long way. You don't have to become an expert in the other field. In fact, you won't have time to. And in a real job, you're not going to be expected to, like, oh, I'm going to paint some textures, and then I'm going to go program over here, and I'm going to do that. Like, of course not. But if you can get, if you're, like, say, a designer, and you can learn a little bit of how programmers work in their lingo, right, and you can interact with them, that is going to get you so far, both in terms of how your team works together, your reputation, all that kind of stuff. Particularly with designers, designers who can script absolutely have my heart. Okay, you are, you are my heroes. And so I would encourage any designer who's even remotely interested to look into kind of scripting, programming, any kind of stuff like that where you can help. And I mean, as, as an example at Epic, right, we actually have designers who are not only amazing at this, but they have such like prior past engagement experience that they've worked on gameplay systems that I haven't. Uh, like, so for instance, we have a guy who did basically all the itemization in Star Wars The Old Republic, like MMO scale level itemization, right? I can go talk to him and be like, hey, how do you do this? And he can tell me almost at a technical level. Like it's almost like talking to another programmer and he can start outlining like, well, here's some ideas for architecture of how we would do it. And it's almost like instead of giving me just a design, he's giving me a text back and it's amazing, right? Like I want to work with this guy every day. <laughs> like, awesome. And so if you don't put that effort in up front, you're not ever really going to get there because it's Especially here, you're given an opportunity where you know you can just walk in and I'm going to sit in on Tom class or I'm going to do that stuff. And that's just so invaluable that I can't stress enough that you really should take advantage of that if you can. Also, because engineering everywhere you go is always a scrap resource. Always. So if you can do anything at all to take time off of like the engineers and free them up to work on more low-level systems, you are helping the project immensely, like so much. We have a we have a designer at our work. Who always tells me because I mentioned him one day that our gameplay program reproduction at Epic has never closed from the time I've been there. Like we just can't get a good enough, enough good ones because you always need them. And he's like, you know, I've never been in the studio and they're like, you know, we just have so many good programmers, just just close it down. You know, not we don't need it anymore, right? Like that doesn't happen. The engineers are always busy, and so if you can take something off of their load and help out in that way, like people are going to love you. So you know, it's something you really should consider. And then finally, I mean, just just enjoy yourself, right? Like there's, like I said, I learned so many things here about myself, about my personality, and you should do the same. It's great. So another thing is, a lot of people get really caught up on I have to build this awesome portfolio, and to a degree, that's absolutely true, right? Your portfolio is important. You have to do that. But I think sometimes people do that to the exclusion of anything else, right? Like they get really okay. I've got to have this awesome portfolio, and is it important? Yes. Is it the only thing important? I say no. I would say arguably more important is focusing on building your reputation and your character. Because if those falter, I don't care how good your portfolio is, you're done, right? Like it's not getting you in the door. And so I kind of did, let's see, that's the simple lesson, right? Like that's, don't be a jerk. I put it on a ribbon because that's that's all you need to know, right? And it's it sounds simple, but for some people it's really hard because they get they get focused on like my portfolio has to be the best. Or I've got to, you know, I gotta show everybody up. 
And if you if you underestimate the value of good communication and good good teamwork within your team, then you're going to be really sad. So if you give me a choice and I'm making a team, and I can pick between two programmers, and one of them is the rock star programmer, best guy of all time. And I mean, he can do any task he wants. He can do it faster than anyone else. But anytime anyone comes up to him and asks him for help, he's like, okay, but you know, he gives him gives him crap. Versus a guy who's going to make mistakes. He's slower or whatever. But everyone on the team loves to work with him, right? They're going to they're going to come to him for problems, and you know that he's going to help solve them. I will take that guy every single time. Nobody wants to work with the guy who's a jerk, no matter how good he is. It doesn't matter. And it will start affecting you in ways that you don't expect. And so I kind of did, like, as a thought exercise, I went back to this math, and I was like, what if I just think about, in my relatively short career, every friend or place that I have in the studio to somewhere else, put them on a map, and these are people that I would consider comfortable contacting tomorrow if I had to, to ask if somebody applied, if that person was good, right? And so I started filling it in, I'm like, oh, okay, that's actually kind of a lot of states. Let's, let's go, oh, that's actually a lot of countries, right? And they're big ones, too. Like, there are one, like, the BioWares of the world, and Epic, and, you know, and you got Microsoft, and Amazon, and all that thing. And I want to put a couple caveats on this, too. Uh, oh, actually, an international, too, right? So, I mean, yep, I have friends all over there, too. The thing is, this isn't comprehensive, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, the way I made this list was, A, just think about it off the top of my head, B, quickly scan through Facebook, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's really work, okay. Two, I'm kind of a terrible friend, and I don't do a good job keeping up with people, so I'm sure that there are people that I really care about that are in awesome places that aren't on this list, because I'm terrible, but that's something to consider also. Two, this isn't an extended network at all. This isn't factoring that I ask any of these people at all what their network is and go out like one more time that they have friends. Because once you do that, you might as well fill the map in and probably most of the rest of the studio that are considered major studios in the world, right? Third, I suck at networking so bad, so bad. Like, so I, I love presentations and if you put me up in front, like I, I like to do and silly or whatever, you put me in a networking event, I'm the guy who hides in the corner, right? Like I'm not gonna walk up and talk to people. If you come up and talk to me, I will be as friendly as I can be. But I'm not going to go over there and talk to you. So if you, you send me these events, I don't do great at networking. And so this is not even representative of what probably an average of, uh, person in the industry with five years experience has. This is probably much less. If I had asked a friend at work to fill this in, I bet it would have been ridiculous. And fourth, this is current jobs only. This isn't factoring in that all of these friends also, like me, probably went two or three different places and could fill in this stuff also. And so. If you think about it in those terms, this is a double-edged sword that is either awesome or going to make your life a miserable mess. So, I mean, pretend you and I are classmates and I really enjoyed your work, you know, we worked together awesome and your work ethic was great. You contact me and you're like, oh, I'd really like to work at such and such place. Look how many options you have that I could forward like a recommendation like, yeah, that person was awesome. But if you were a jerk and you caused trouble, <coughs> even like in, at grad school level with your current students, Look how many places you probably just blacklisted yourself from. And I, I know that like sounds harsh and maybe that doesn't happen, but it does. Like I've already seen this two or three times in the industry. Guy applied, has an amazing portfolio. Like all other things considered would be hired on the spot. He's awesome. Hiring person says, hey, I noticed this person worked at company X. You worked at company X. What do you think? Oh, that person, wow, I don't ever want to work with them again. Guess what happens? Portfolio and a resume in the dumpsters. The people in the discipline that you were trying to get to didn't even see it. Doesn't get any further than that. And you're up the creek, right? So I can't emphasize enough. If you take nothing else out of all the rest of the lessons, it's the don't be a jerk lesson is the most important thing for the whole industry, period. <laughs> okay. So you move on for via <coughs> internship hunt. Finishing something is actually super important too. And I think why is going to set you up great right here, and then you know you have a capstone project, and assuming that all goes well, you'll have a finished product to show people, and that worked really well when I started applying for internships, right? That's great. But often when people come and approach me and ask me, like, how do I get started in the industry? How do you get an internship or whatever? I tell them to finish something, and then I get slammed with excuses about why they didn't finish something. And they usually go something like this. Well, I need to show versatility. Which is code word for, I started 40 projects, got all of them 5% of the way through, and didn't actually finish anything. Which, you know, if, if you want to spin it as like, look how versatile I am, I can work on all these different things, you could. But to a lot of people, they're going to treat that as like, well, you didn't actually have the discipline or the commitment to finish a single thing. So I can't really trust you on my part. 
Second one, this idea is better than the one I'm working on now, so I really need to abandon what I'm doing because this one's going to look better. That often is kind of an excuse we tell ourselves because we want an excuse to start again when we don't really want to finish. So I would say be very careful here. Maybe it legitimately is so much better that, okay, that's fine. But I would still make an effort to finish what you're doing because this is an easy, easy way to sabotage yourself. Other project X is already doing something similar. I've actually heard this one a lot. Let me tell you something, especially if you're a programmer. If you apply to a job in which I had any influence on hiring you, and you did something like, let's say you made a platformer, and you finished it, and it's awesome, I'm going to think, wow, that is awesome. Look at that. They completed the project. I am not going to think, you know, I think Mario did something like this. So, <laughs> you know, like, 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 like I, I don't care, right? I'm more impressed that you finished something, and that you saw it through, and it's a coherent thing, and it's a great <coughs> example of your skill. That's awesome, right? I don't care that somebody else may have done something similar. There are very few truly original ideas anymore. Like a lot of things are always built on something else. And you don't <coughs> think that you like went off and stole somebody's design. Like it happened. And then the fourth one, this is the one that people at work, I'm sure if they're watching, you're going to laugh and call me a hypocrite because I'm notoriously bad at this. I can't finish without feature X and Y and Z or whatever. So, okay, my reputation here and proceeded throughout my career is that I'm a notorious go bomber. I don't know when to stop. But even I can recommend that you need to have scoping as a skill in your back pocket. You need to know what you are capable of doing realistically and be able to execute on that. And so, again, especially if you're working by yourself or in a small group on a side project, when you apply somewhere and you show them, like, this is what I produced, they're going to know that and understand that. They're not expecting you to make a AAA game as your, as your demo reel, right? And so don't sabotage yourself into never finishing something that would have been perfectly fine because you're convinced it needs a billion other features. I'll give you an example on our FIA game. Not only did we decide that we were going to make an RTS, at the beginning until Rick eventually intervened and told us we were morons, we were like, it's going to be fully networked and it's going to have a tutorial. By the way, we'll have four modes of AI. And like, <laughs> we just kept going. And he was like, if you finish any of those, I will be amazed. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, you gotta, you gotta rein it in. And then practice makes perfect. And if you think about it, if the only thing you're practicing is how to start a project 500 times, you're not actually practicing making a game. Because like the old adage of like, well, 80% of the work is in the last 20%, in my experience, is pretty close to true. But you're never actually getting that far. There's a reason that a lot of jobs when you apply are like, you better have a ship title if you're applying. And it's partially this. They want to see that you actually finish something. Like, just don't continue to tread and do nothing. So next, practice the interview, too. So I think in particular, programmers are in danger for this one, but it applies to everyone. So the knowledge pool for computer science is just too large to know anything <coughs> that you're, you're going to possibly be asked about. And this, this is something I failed really hard at when I started, started interviewing. Like, the instructors here even told me, like, oh, you better practice the interview process. You better do that. And I was like, I don't think you understand. I need to know graph theory. So no. And I just spent all of my time studying every computer science topic in the universe that I could think of. What ends up happening is you spread yourself super thin. You don't even remember most of the things you studied again. And then you show up, and the guy in the interview decides that his favorite question is some algorithm that you learned one day in undergrad for one time, and there's no way you're going to remember it anyway. And you're like, wow, did I waste all of my time. So absolutely, you should study, and you should have the fundamentals and everything down. But you can't like stress and fret yourself out into crazy town. They're like, I have to know everything that was ever taught in the history of computer science. Because you're not going to be able to do it, and you're just going to make yourself really sad. And so also, you need to be prepared. And this really caught me off guard. Some places are going to ask you questions that make you uncomfortable. And how you react to that, obviously, is up to you. But I would also posit that some places when they ask those questions, if you feel that they're really inappropriate, that's a good way to filter that maybe I don't actually want to work with. And so an example is when I was looking for an internship, and you know, to some people maybe this is perfectly reasonable and I was overreacting, and that's, that's totally fine. But I had somebody ask me when we were working on our project, like, oh, you're the lead programmer on the FIA project. I want you to rank all of the people, all the programmers on your team numerically, including yourself, and tell me what all they are. And I thought I politely responded. I was like, you know what? Look, all of us work together very closely. I feel confident that anyone on this team can do any task that I give them. We're all effectively like brothers, and I will not comfortably rank anyone on this particular team more important than the other or better than anything. 
right? I'm just not willing to do it. So let's please ask another question. They weren't willing to accept that. And then they pushed me and asked it like five or six different times. To the point where then I lost my cool and I was like, 2.5! Ah! <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? Okay, I don't, I don't want to work it. Because if they weren't willing to accept that, that crossed my line, right? Like, I'm not, I'm sorry. Now, like I said, some people may think that's unreasonable and they would respond differently to that, and that's fine. But you have to know where your boundary is and you have to expect that people are going to ask you things that put you, you know, on an edge and off. And if it's someplace you really want to work, you can't scream 2.5 and snap it to my phone because they're not going to want to hire you either. Play their game. Now, this should be obvious. And I know it's why I've expressed this a million times too, but it still happens. Like, we get applicants, come in, and I'll tell you right now, if you were a gameplay applicant at Epic Games and you come in and I ask you about our stuff, and you're like, oh, I've never played here before. Oh, I don't know what Unreal Tournament is. You have dug yourself a hole that you better be amazing to get yourself back out of it. It's like, it takes so little effort to actually go and play their games and be knowledgeable about their stuff that if you don't do it, it's almost like, why did you even bother? Do you really want to work here because you couldn't take a day to check that out? I mean, ultimately, you should be playing games anyway if you're in this industry and you love it, right? People are going to be able to see through fake passion or like, I'm just plumbing it in. So really make sure you do that too. In particular, for programmers, you're going to get asked brain <coughs> questions at a lot of places. And that's not something I was really prepared for either, because I was like, programmer interview, all programming questions all the time, here we go. And then you get asked a brain teaser question. I was like, oh, what is the point of this? And so the thing I want to emphasize here is, these kind of split to me in two camps. The places that are interviewing you who may ask these, either know that what they're trying to get out of you is how you think, right? So to them, it's not actually that important that you get the right answer, or that you get there even fast. It's talking out loud to them, like, here's how I would solve this, I think. Oh, no, that doesn't work. Okay, what if I did this? What if I did that? And even if you don't get the right answer, they don't care. They just want to see how you, you think through a problem. So first, don't stress yourself out like, oh, I have no idea. I'm never going to solve this problem, right? Because you're going to sabotage yourself on the spot because the natural reaction is you clam up and don't say anything to them. All they want is you to talk to them. You can say almost gibberish nonsense as long as you're slowly working your way through the problem and they're going to be fine. Now, unfortunately, there is also a second group of companies that you may eventually run into who think the point of brain teasers is that you get the exact answer immediately. I would argue if you run into that, you don't want to work here. So, last one is the whiteboard. In particular, programmers, you are going to run into whiteboard questions with them. If they're going to ask you to do stuff, you need to practice this. More, like, more than anything else interview-wise, because again, this was something I didn't give the proper respect and time to. And I'll give you a story about how terrible this went for me. But basically, grab some of your coworkers or you know, co-classmates, go in a side room. It doesn't even matter what they ask you. Have them ask you like what your name is and write it on the board or whatever. You need to get used to the process of standing in front of a crowd and having to write things on demand on the board. Or this, like, this will turn into like super villain status on you, right? Like, if you, if you have to do this, it will break you if you're not ready. And so I will give you my my story. I actually, one of the first uh, internship places that I got was you know, local developer in space. Awesome, like lots of alumni there, it was great. Went there, I was super excited. It was my first real job interview. I thought I was doing fine. Time came, I had to do something on the whiteboard. Totally not prepared, not prepared at all. And so I'm like sweating and all scared. And I'm like turning there and I'm like trying to, trying to focus and I'm writing the thing. And the thing is I'm left-handed. And so while I'm doing this, marker is just smearing all the way down my marker. Like everywhere. And you know, left hand problems right this. But I finish and I'm like super sweaty and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I turn around and they blow up laughing at me because I have like all over the place. But they don't they didn't have time to explain it before like my heart shattered. I'm like, oh my goodness, my answer is so bad. <laughs> And I, I was destroyed. And they're like, no, no, you have raccoon face. Like, you totally <laughs> But it didn't matter. Like, the rest of that interview was done. I guarantee you, if you ask them, they probably thought I had never programmed anything in here, like, ever. Like, I couldn't have even correctly answer if you asked me what my name was after that. It was over. And that was, like, the worst interview I have ever had. So I can't stress enough that you need to prepare for this, or it will be your undoing. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that said, I somehow managed to get through the, the interview process at least once to Midway. And so I and I think four or five of us from our cohort were actually all accepted. We moved up to Chicago, Midway, and we'll start our story there. Oh, there's, there's a picture of me and Fruit looking a little bit fuzzy. Um, Jill and Al, we had, we had a great time. My, my title there was Software Engineer Intern. We were working on an unannounced third third person kind of action adventure game that's unfortunately doomed to never be released. So that would be really cool. you know, if you're not super familiar with Midway, uh, you know, they're famous for a lot of things, including my favorite identity game jam, but obviously Mortal Kombat is probably what they're most famous for. Uh, okay, I'm gonna waste your time here for like 45 seconds as, as a life lesson side story, which really is just an excuse to watch a clip that I love, it's hilarious. But. So when you move for the first time, because for me this was the first time that I ever moved out of Florida, like a really long distance. And uh, like four of us actually ended up getting a, I think we had a four four house together. We're like, we're gonna live together. It's gonna be great. We didn't really have time to go check it out in advance. Uh, for the most part, things turned out fine. And I, I just like to bust on Corey on the, on the left there is the one who found us the house. And he did, he did a pretty good job. Like all things considered, it was great, right? But we ran into a couple of little silly problems, and they always made me laugh. And so the lesson is, when you move, if you can have somebody like check out the place first, that's awesome. You know, if you can go be with yourself before you can into it, that's awesome too, because you never know what's going to happen. And so I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Money Pit. <laughs> uh, if you have, it has a scene in it that like makes me lose my mind every time I see it. It's really short. Let's see if it actually will load. Uh, 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 more prepared presenter might have loaded this in advance. Oh my goodness, I don't know how to get it over there. Let's see. <laughs> Hold on. The master. Let's see. You might be able to minimize. No, no, well, kind of. Is it off the website? Or? Yeah, but it's okay. It's at least a. <laughs> Rod, just act it out. But you know the scene, Rod. Right? Meeting for a second. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm a programmer, I swear. <laughs> All right. So this is just a quick, silly scene. exactly how I would react. <laughs> and two, that something like that would never happen. So in our house, roommate is doing dishes and he's pouring water into the sink. The sink proceeds to fall through the counter, dump all the water like a tidal wave out the front cabinet, and it bursts open and spilled water all over <laughs> True to self, that was my reaction. I was like, what is wrong? I was losing my mind and my roommate was like, what is wrong with you? The floor is ruined. Like, our sink is broken, and I I thought I was going to die. I couldn't breathe. It was just so long. And so that was a brief waste of time, but I would, I would again emphasize to you to really check out the place you're going to move to if you can. All right, so at Midway, learn very quickly, you better be super passionate if you're going to be right? Like, you should already start to feel it here, but it becomes even more obvious when you move out to the industry. Because the thing is, everyone is there because they want to. There's a lot of jobs where you're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm here because I need a paycheck. I gotta, get up. I gotta finish it. But when you're talking video game industry, pretty much everyone you meet is there because they want to make video games. That's their thing, right? And because if they weren't, they could, especially as a programmer, you could probably find better hours, more job security, 
probably higher pay, right? So people are making sacrifices on purpose because this is their thing. They're passionate about it. And if you're not, they're going to know, and you're just not going to fit in, right? It's just not, it's not going to be great. Also, everyone has ideas. Like, I know a lot of people, before they get in the industry, like, oh, I have all these great ideas. I'm going to be the idea man. I'm going to guide how this goes. I'll be, it's going to be fantastic. The thing is, everyone has ideas, no matter what their position is. Like the audio guy, he probably has like five great, great ideas for the game alone, right? And so you can't expect, especially as a designer, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna roll in, it could be on me. It's me, I'm the design show. Sorry, you're ready to just come down. Because everyone has tons of ideas. And like, I, I remember, I think, when I first came here, and then the faculty beat it out of us almost immediately, like, you shouldn't be doing this. Because so, you know, everybody has to, like, this is my great idea that I've been saving for four years, and no one can know it's because it's great. Right, like you very quickly realize that that's completely invalid because everyone has all of those ideas and they probably have more than you. Second, people respond to passion. Like when you are truly passionate about something, and people can tell, they will follow you. They will want to work with you, and they will become more motivated in the stuff they do too. Likewise, if you are completely dull and not interested and don't want to do this, then they'll know too and they'll leave you behind. So passion is really important in everything you do. Uh, the thing I want to talk about is experience with youth, and in particular, I think when you start applying for internships and jobs, this is an easy frustration that you're going to run into because there are still a lot of places that maybe don't quite realize the value that a young, like new employee can have, and you're going to run into places that are like, well, I don't know, you didn't ship 400 times today, so probably shouldn't work here. Uh, I will use this brief time to plug that we will eventually have internships at Epic. So. But going back to the, you know, the, the crotchety old man and, and the young dude, it's very easy for a lot of people to view this as a strictly one-way transfer that is only beneficial to this dude. And so it's like, well, look, he's gaining experience on the job. He's getting all that guy's knowledge. It's awesome. Oh, he's a net trained on product, too, because he's not actually accomplishing much. And that guy has to use his time to teach him. What a shame. And he's being paid to learn. What a great deal for him, right? And they're not willing to acknowledge that it actually goes the other way too, because this guy is an idea and energy infusion. In particular, like people who have been in the industry a really long time can get jaded, right? Like they've seen a lot and they've they've been excited but also disappointed. And so they're still passionate, but there's there's a bit of like jaded crust there, right? And you get the young guy in there, he kind of feels that way. Like especially you pair them together, right? You might revitalize this older employee when he's working with a younger person. Again, kind of on that same thing, they're coming in with no baggage. They're not ruined by a past job or boss that was disastrous that completely decimated their will to live, right? So <laughs> they're having a great time, and they're super excited to be there. And then finally, this person has a huge morale boost on the team in general. Like, so in midway, we're all crunching. Uh, we're working on a, a, a deadline for the thing. It's like winter. It's freezing cold. Which, is, by the way, I was in my thermal underwear and everything for me. Not from Florida. Like that just wasn't my thing. And when everyone's like, oh. You know, so many hours, but you have the room of like interns down the hallway and they're play testing the game and who can holler and like, did you see that? That is so awesome. Right? Like all the people come out of their office and they're like, oh yeah, now I remember why I do this job again. Right? Like, so this is not a one-way transfer, and you will find places that understand that. So it'll be a little bit frustrating at first. You're gonna get denied probably multiple times when I'm like, well, you don't actually have a lot of experience yet. Happened to me, you'll see. Actually happened to that big multiple times, you'll see. But they've you know, they've kind of appreciated and learned that, you know, the young guy also can contribute. So, another, like, this is this is kind of more preachy thing, and, you know, you can tell me to shut up if you want, but I suggest to you that you really need to learn common tools and particular stuff like Perforce, and not just learn them to a passable degree, but try and be super proficient. So I know a lot of people who are capable of checking a file out and submitting it and doing nothing more. And I would submit to you that that is not a good use of your job. If you can do more, it is an investment in your future, right? It's very easy to like, hey, I'm super proficient in this, and then you just tell somebody, and then you can prove it, and then hey, that's a, a big check mark on your resume. That's awesome, right? Like, because they know they can just dump you into their company, and they don't have to train you on that. Awesome, right? It's super helpful to other people too. If I had a nickel for every time throughout my career I helped somebody with a performance issue, I would be a super rich man. Like, that's that's you know, it happens all the time, and it saves heartache. And an example at Fiat is one of the artists in our cohort who I love, super nice guy. Uh, super talented. He came to me one day and he was like, hey, you know, I have an issue with Perforce and, you know, I wanted to submit a file, but there's a lot of stuff on my screen and I don't think it's quite right. He had the entire dude bum mark for deletion. <laughs> so, now, luckily, he didn't submit it, but 
you can imagine the heartache that would have caused for his team had he done so. <laughs> We just had someone that did the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not an uncommon thing. <laughs> so, okay. The other thing I learned in a hurry anything you make, oh, you want shiny fish thing that I made? Somebody else going to use it. And they're probably going to use it in the way you didn't expect. And you're probably not going to like what they do with it. And so that's really important to consider. Pretty much for all disciplines, right? Like if you're an artist, you're working on a model, you can bet somebody eventually else is going to use that model too. Especially for a programmer, and if you're writing gameplay systems or whatever, there's going to be so many hands in that cookie jar, you're going to be really sad. So you better do a good job in the first time because you know this is going to kind of affect your reputation going forward. And so I'll give you a couple examples. Again, we had a midway, we were in crunch time, uh, we had a UI artist working on like these binary files for and he was pretty convinced that he was the only person that could do this and he was working on it and he decided I think he had a vacation so he was out of town on the weekend but it was crunch time we knew it done it wasn't done it was like well all hands on deck somebody else is going to do it right now except he left with the files checked out in Perforce so nobody could touch them so what happened is call up the Perforce administrator please nuke his account for Morgan and so they did all of his work was totally lost forcibly unlocked all his things and anything he had in progress, gone, because we needed those files and we need right now. That's, that's one example. Second, I worked on kind of like this character generation tool. And I worked on it for probably two or three weeks. I told people at the end of our sprint, hey, we probably didn't have enough time to work on this. Uh, it's probably 70% of the way done. We're just not going to use it yet, right? We're going to have time to do it. Of course we will. Don't worry about it. We know it's not done. Well, didn't get time. Didn't get scheduled. Three weeks later, uh oh, people are using the character tool. It's not finished. Like, it's causing like malformed data and breaking things. It's a disaster. But they needed it right now. And so you, you have to assume that something is going to come up and someone else is going to use it. And it, they're not always like dire, like crunch time or somebody screwed up situations. But, like, a really good example say you're a gameplay programmer working on systems work and you are working on multiple core systems that are very large. Uh, so, this is actually happening to me on Fortnite right now. I've worked on like two or three. Well, pretend the goals for this spread and like we need for this next deadline, all three of them need upgrade changes simultaneously. You can't do them all, so somebody else is doing your work now. And like I said, again, this, this is really huge. It goes back to the whole building reputation thing. Aside from being a jerk, your work really needs to represent you well because you have to assume somebody is going to inherit what you've done. And the easier you make it for them, and the clearer it is to like post comments or like you kept how your models are set up clean and all that stuff, the better your reputation is going to be. If you get the reputation as the guy like, oh, his systems are crashing garbage and I don't understand how anything works, right? That's really going to negatively impact you in a harsh way over time. Uh, the other thing I really learned in Midway is you have to choose your battles, um, especially with game features and things like that, because nobody wants to be that guy. And this one usually takes people a while to learn. <coughs> this took me a while to learn. Because the thing is, especially in the industry, you're super passionate. Oh, I have a billion ideas about everything. I just want I just want to help, right? I'm just trying to be as beneficial as possible. And you're just like, oh, what if we did this? What if we did this? What if we did this? Oh, what about this system, right? The thing is, you kind of like, as you're working somewhere, you're you're crewing this like political capital of like how how well you're gonna perform, like you perform on things, how reliable you are, whatever. And as you decide to draw the line in the sand on every issue in the world, you are expending part of that every single time. And what you're gonna find is that when an issue that's actually important comes up that you really care about, no one wants to listen to you anymore because you have an opinion on everything. And they're like, oh, he's running his mouth again. Like, okay. Like, so it's really, you really have to choose what is actually important to you. And then that's when you draw the line of the sand. And I think it'd be really important to break guys if we did X, Y, Z here. Because if, if you're the quiet guy who doesn't say much, but when you do, it comes from your heart, right? Like, people are going to respect that. And you're like, oh, he must be serious about this. And the other thing is, people don't realize that when you do this and you have an opinion on everything, you're kind of exhibiting no trust in your team at all. Like, you don't trust them to get the job done, so you're providing your input, which then kind of makes them feel like garbage. And they're probably not going to tell you that, but you are subconsciously, like, ruining all of these relationships as you continue to tell everyone how everything has to be done. So in Midway, for the most part, things were going pretty well. Christmas time comes along, yay! And it was time to go back to Playa to talk about the internship. 
right before I left, they're like, hey, you know, you're doing a great job. I have a full time contract waiting for you. I think it was like Christmas Eve. Anna shows up. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> From a point of malicious intent, I want to I want to get that out there, right? Like they didn't they didn't do it on purpose. I loved my time in Midway; it was great. They weren't like being jerks. They just you know they went bankrupt. A lot of bad things happened in a short period of time. Our whole team had to go, right? Like they couldn't afford to have them in the building, right? You got to you got to go. And so it brings us back to the industry of the rough place part two. Like it's it's super volatile sometimes, and you have to expect that unexpected things are going to happen. Now at the same time. Midway was going through a rough patch, and so, like, to a degree, the writing was kind of on the wall. But before we left, our team in particular was doing pretty well, and we had assurances, like, don't worry, like, you guys are awesome, it's great. No, like, we still, we still got to let go. So you kind of have to be prepared that you might get dumped at any time. Um, also, shipping a game is hard, especially that game that we were working on. I was there for like five or six months, and I poured my heart and soul. Like, I loved it so much. And then when you come to the realization that it is not only over, it's never going to see the light of day, kind of demoralizes you, right? It hurts. And so that takes a little while to get used to, and that's something you're going to experience and have to deal with. I mean, for me, I've been in the industry about five years. You'll see as I go through this, the number of things that I have actually shipped is really low. Like, I've contributed and helped a little bit on a lot of different things, but the things where I felt like I was a primary contributor to and it shipped, is like one thing, and it was a DLC. And hopefully, the project I'm working on now will add that to two. But you know, it's something that you have to keep in mind. It's not it's not a given that I'm in the industry and I'm going to have a, a title on on the shelf. You know, in a couple of days, it's going to be great. It's, production schedules are long, games are expensive to make, and any kind of things can happen along the way, and then you know it doesn't ship. So you should always be super grateful, I think, too, when you actually do ship. Uh, so from there, we made the unemployed journey back to my parents' house. Uh, <laughs> I kind of, I kind of felt crappy doing that actually, because you know you're like, oh, I got my first new job. I'm an adult. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, back home. and so you know, I went back to the job hunt and I actually applied to Epic. Applied to Epic for the very first time, and you know, didn't really have any experience. I had like what five or six months. Way. I applied to a position that was asking for, I think, four years' experience. They were like, did you know that five months is not four years? <laughs> <laughs> well, you make a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't pan out right there. We'll put that in our back pocket. Not, not so much on that one. Um, but as it happened, an opportunity for my home boss, the Midway production, he called me and he was like, hey, I really like your work. I'm um, starting a new startup. I would like you to work for me. What do you think? And for those keeping score at home, that is one for maintaining connections and zero for burning bridges. So <laughs> don't be a jerk, and good things will happen to you. So he started a new studio called Foster Games, and he opened it in Illinois. I left my job in Florida because I was working remotely for most of it because there was still a small studio that didn't actually have a physical space. And I was able to work and code from back and forth. Uh, if you're not familiar with Foster, like I said, they do have a space now. They are in Chicago, in Illinois. Um, they, the first thing that they did that like you might recognize is they made this mini game in particular in Connect Adventures, like Chip and Thing that Chip with Connect. And then they had two pretty successful mobile titles on iOS called Dark Nemo and Horn. I personally didn't actually really work on any of these. I helped for like. I think two days improving the performance on the Dark Meadow. But again, I don't, I don't really count that because obviously a lot of people pour a lot of their effort into it, and so two days, I'm like, okay, I'll have a little. Uh, for the most part, then, so what, what the heck was I doing if I didn't work on any of that stuff? Well, as it happened, it was actually a really amazing opportunity where Epic had happened to contact Foster, or I don't remember how it started, but they were looking for engineers who might be able to help on like little bugs and issues on. The Unreal Engine 3 that they could help with that their engineers weren't going to have time to get to. And so it was kind of amazing to me because as a young programmer without a lot of experience, 
walking into like, hey, you're going to get to work on a real movie. You're like, all of these came to you. It's like, that was mind blowing to me. And so I was like, yeah, let's do it. And we, we got started. And I worked on a lot of Asian editor stuff. And that was terrifying at first. Like, once I got over my initial excitement of like, how awesome is this? Then you realize, hey, when I worked at Fi on the code base, I knew what every single file was. And it was small, and I knew everything. And when I worked at Midway, I was contained in a small little area. And the worst thing I could do was maybe crash our game. Uh-oh, this is a huge global code base that hundreds of licensees across the world use, and Epic uses for their own games. If I screw something up here, there may be serious repercussions. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I eventually got over it, and I was, I was, I was getting better and getting more responsibility. But I will tell you that even towards the end, while I was still doing contract work, I eventually got to help on a couple bugs on Gears of War three. And I remember just being absolutely terrified because one of them was actually kind of risky, and I was going to do something like fix them, like some skeletal meshes or whatever. And I just remember sitting in my house in Florida and thinking to myself, I'm going to be the reason there's going to be a press release that's like, Gears of War 3 canceled. The contract had corrupted all of the meshes in the game. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's it. It's going to be curtains for me. The industry over. Uh, and so it was scary, but it was still an awesome experience. Uh, so, Indie Light at a, at a small indie studio, actually, like you might expect, kind of liberating, right? You kind of feel like you can start this company from its bootstraps and you can do anything, you can do whatever you want. And actually, for Foster, I think I was in the first 10 employees, and I think I was employee number four or five, right? So, it was like, and the ground floor, things that I do can have a serious impact here, it's awesome, right? And it feels really good. Now, the flip side is, Industry is a Rough Place Part 3 was also terrifying. And like this is through no fault of my boss here. My boss here was super awesome. Like he was an amazingly nice guy midway, continued the trend here. Like couldn't have asked for a better boss. But when you realize, especially after the whole like the Christmas slang incident at Midway, right, that as a small studio that needs resources to continue to run, that if any of those dry up at any time, you could again be out of a job, it's kind of really scary, right? Like what if the door is closed tomorrow? It's a scary thing. And in particular, you also realize that small studios, when they're first starting, and I mean, I think Foster probably be not at this now because they've had a successful trail, but like they've done a lot of things now. You don't really have a lot of clout from any of them, like not publishers, not anything. And so, like, if you deal with a publisher, they're not going to give you a good deal. They're not even going to try, right? Like, you have to, why would they? Like, it wouldn't make sense from their perspective or financial sense, right? Because you are not a proven commodity. You haven't shown that you can actually accomplish something. So, to ask them to give you a favorable deal is putting a tremendous amount of risk on them, right? And so, you know, can't expect that there. So it's a little bit scary. And then you also learn that it's really important to start balancing your wants versus needs. I, I found it in the middle of that way. Um, so. But the thing is, you you get into the situation, and especially in, in indie things, like, well, this is the kind of game you really want to make. Like, we have a great idea, and our team is super passionate about it. But it's super expensive. We don't have funding right now. And if we did it, everyone would eventually be out of a job. So we, we need to do these other things that we would prefer not to do right now in order to hopefully eventually get to the one. And when, you real, when you're under those restrictions and you realize that it's a little bit of a lot. So you know, that's something you may, you may work to. Another thing you very quickly learn is you need to contribute wherever you can, you know, even if it's not your first choice. And I would argue, not even in an indie studio, pretty much anywhere you go. This is a really, again, great way to build your reputation and have people super interested in wanting to work with you. You're, you're going to get somewhere, and your first choice is probably not going to be the most, especially as a new person. Right? You're not going to be like, well, I'm going to be in charge of the most important system. OK, right now, sorry. Like, that's not going to happen. So the more flexible you can be and show that you're willing to get through things, and I can do it, like the further you're going to go, people are going to start trusting you. Like, hey, he did a really good job on something that wasn't his first choice, but he followed through. That's awesome. Uh, for me, anyone who really knows me knows like gameplay is kind of my jam, right? Like, I, I love gameplay stuff. And so, when the option was for me, like you're doing engine, you know, you're doing bug fixes stuff. Don't get me wrong, that is an amazing opportunity, and I love to have it. But down in my heart, I knew this was not what I got. I want to make gameplay stuff. That's what I want to do. Um, you also find that you, especially in an indie studio, you're going to wear many hats, right? Your job description is going to say programmer or artist or whatever. 
but you're not going to sit at your desk and just run this all day. Like the amount of things I did at Phosphor that were like totally miscellaneous. So, in addition to bug fixing stuff, I eventually like helped mentor or train new people. I had to write scripts that maintained like our front four server and stuff like that. I trained people. I made bash files that help our artists do things, right? Like you're going to start wearing hats all over the place in all different kinds of departments. And it's cool because you learn a whole bunch of diverse skills, but it also means like if you think you're just going to sit at your desk and program all day, that's probably not going to be true. And again, it all goes back to the reputation. The happier you're able to do this and the more effective you're able to do this and do it with a smile, right? That will build your reputation and help you eventually get where you want. Now, all that said, warning because obligatory, sappy, inspirational items coming because I think every PowerPoint presentation deserves a display. You will come to a point where you have to follow your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so, to me, I mean, it's going to be sappy or whatever, right? But like I said, gameplay is my thing, and so that's how I express my creativity. And I love to entertain people, but I'm not an actor. I'm not a painter. I'm not an artist, I'm not a poet. I express myself through gameplay mechanics and code. And I know that sounds silly, but that's that's how it is, right? That is my way to entertain people. I try my best, and I hope you have a good time. With that and as awesome as Phosphor was to me, and they were nice, I didn't feel like this was going to happen with their time frame anytime soon, right? And that's no fault of their own. Like, they were trying their hardest. They knew this is what I wanted to do. They were actively working towards it, and so it was, it put me in a really like weird and conflicted state because I didn't want to like leave them because again I was one of the like first employees. I thought we were doing a great job building it up, but I knew it like I wasn't really feeling fulfilled overall, and so it kind of led to a very hard decision of like I need to go talk to my boss about this. And so I talked to him, and I went, hey, honesty is going to be the best approach here, and you know that's kind of how I've always operated. I can't say that that is always 100% the best. Best choice because I walked in there, and again, my boss is super nice, and I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna fly elsewhere, right? Like this, this is not satisfying what I want." Now, you get to a boss who isn't nice or whatever, that probably means he's making the decision for you when you're fired. So I can't say that this is always the best course of action if you don't have a backup plan. But for me, I walked in there, I felt that it was important to me, and so I told him, "Hey, I'm flying somewhere else." And I've been working as a contractor for Epic, and I know I've always wanted to work there, so I'm gonna fly there. Again. So I apply there again. I get to interview, and our nemesis friend, the whiteboard, shows up again. So I'll give you a story again, and why being actually prepared for the whiteboard was pretty useful this time. So I'm doing whiteboard questions. Left hand would be dance still. Didn't change that. And so I'm writing marker smearing all down my hand. And I turn around, and I'm about to do it again. And I'm like, no! Aha! And I, and I caught myself. I'm like, yes, I'm so glad I did this. While I'm doing that and celebrating, like my mini little celebration, take my hand and do this <laughs> and make a racing strike down my back. Like, oh, my ankle. Now, at the time, I had emailed the engineering director at Epic, but I hadn't met him in person, so I didn't know his personality. And everything he had shown me up to that point was just pure seriousness, right? Like. That's how it goes. He notices the racing stripe that I have painted on my khakis. He stares at me and just grabs my resume off the table, balls it up, throws it in the garbage, and he's like, Billy, after all of this time, you couldn't even come here with clean pants? What is wrong with you? Yeah! And like, my heart stopped. I, was, I thought I was going to die. But I'm sitting there like, Okay, you've already done worse than this before. Keep it together. <laughs> and then, <laughs> by the time I like recovered myself, he blew up laughing. He's like, "Of course, I'm just kidding." But if you need to use the restroom now, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I excused myself, and then I was able to recover and do well than I thought in the rest of the interview. And so. <laughs> It definitely pays to have prepared and gone through that experience, or again, you will break under pressure. So, you know, I figured, did pretty well, went to the interview, I was like, okay, well, I'm always a worrier, so I didn't, I didn't feel super confident, but I was like, as far as interviews go for me, that was probably as good as it's going to get, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, that's it, right? So, you know, happily ever after, blah, blah, blah. No. <laughs> so, Actually denied again. 
Because the thing is, they asked me when I applied, well, you have done an awesome job on the editors of this stuff, but you're applying for a gameplay position, and ultimately, you still don't have experience there. <laughs> like, ah, <laughs> don't <forget. laughs> Right? And so, at the time when I left and I went home, I remember kind of almost feeling like how, like, the people storm off American Idol, like, I don't need to be, I'll show you, right? And, <laughs> But then when I got home and actually thought about it more, I was like, okay, well, from their perspective, they're absolutely right. Like, I don't have experience here. And so, okay, again, I applied for a position that was kind of over my head. And at the time, I kind of feel like if I had said, hey, I really just want to be that good work, right? That wouldn't have been true to myself, but I feel like I may have gotten a job, a pretty good job. Um, but I, I just wasn't willing to, to compromise there. Like, even though Epic would have been awesome and I gladly would have helped whoever I could, I knew gameplay is what I wanted to do. Right? That's what I had to do. Uh, so, Phosphor, my cross back to Phosphor, like, by the way, guys, uh, I blew it. <laughs> Sorry about that. And, you know, like, I was kind of like so out of it temporarily that I was like, okay, I'm not going to buy it. As it so happens, I got a gameplay chance from my boss again, and again, if we're keeping score, that's two to zero now for not returning to the <laughs> because he appreciated that I was honest with it. The caveat was if I wanted whatever the gameplay work was, I now did have to move to Illinois, which I was more than happy to do. And I will give you life lesson number two. Uh, I picked some fly by night movers because they were the only people who could actually get me there in the time frame. Don't. Like, either move yourself or get a mover that you actually investigate. Because the dude I got not only showed up late, but then only accept cash because, quote, otherwise Uncle Sam gets a piece of the pie. <laughs> <laughs> when he dropped off my white Silva, it had somehow become mildew green. It was all green. He broke my table that was made of solid wood, which I'm pretty convinced if you wanted to break would require an axe. I don't know <laughs> how he did this. And he straight up stole my computer monitor, which I didn't realize until later. So not worth it to get the fly by night guy. That's, that's, and it basically spoiled my entire time at, at Chicago because I was so demoralized in this, I didn't unpack. Like, I left my little mildew couch drawn sideways in the apartment, and I just, like, face planted into my bed, and I'm like, we're done. And the whole time I was in Chicago, I left those boxes back. I was like, no. Like, it's rude. And so, what ended up happening with Phosphor is the assignment they got was actually that Epic was going to contract for help engineering on the single player DLC for Heroes of War 3, because their engineers were, like, really busy and needed help. And so, I was able to do it, and then they eventually dispatched me to Epic's headquarters. And like it would be the easiest for you know if you worked here, because it revealed some issues that I didn't also know that were festering within myself. First, being this close to Florida, I could easily visit my family. Like they came up, and I I've always been big on the family thing, but I didn't quite realize in Chicago just how much I had missed them. And then them being able to quickly get there, I was like, oh yeah, this is kind of a problem in Chicago. The second thing is like I said, I've lived almost all my life in Florida. Cold weather and I are kind of. You know, this was outside my apartment in March. Like, those are icicles in March. Like, just no. <laughs> like, I can't do that. And so, you know, had to have boss talk number two. I'm like, hey, you are an awesome guy, and you've given me a lot of chances, but this this is now never going to work for me. Like, I completely appreciate everything you've done. You guys have been awesome, but it's not going to work. And so, I'm going to fly around. I'll probably try to fly to Epic again. What's the worst I can say? And if that doesn't work, I'm just going to fly somewhere else, right? Like, so consider this is the end of my employment here. And he understood, you know, he was super nice to me, and that's awesome. I applied to Epic again, and again, showing the, the value of persistence, they finally said yes the third time. And in fact, I would say probably my favorite part of my career is that uh, one person there said, we, we made a really silly mistake that would let you walk out the door a second time, right? And I was like, oh, that's so awesome. So, what did Epic? Now, I realize that I'm actually taking a long time here, so we're going to have to speed this along. <laughs> so, moved Bill Jalopy down to Harry, worked at Epic. Uh, if you're not familiar with Epic, they are obviously the Unreal Engine that powers hundreds of games all each year. In the past, they were way for a Unreal Tournament, obviously, Gears of War lately. For me, I worked, like I said, pretty heavily on the DLC. I was one of the primary programmers on that. 
uh, and got to do a lot of cool feature implementations. I worked a little bit on Spear 3 Judgment and Infinity Blade 2, wherein that's like two weeks of helping fix bugs or whatever. So again, overall contribution, I don't feel like I shipped those titles, but I helped on those. Currently, I'm working on Fortnite. If you're not familiar with it, I can't talk too much about it today, but it's basically co-op, third-person action survival game, got some RPG mechanics in there. It focuses very heavily on being able to build like gigantic buildings and castles that the players can build in 3D space and like, these huge, awesome structures. And I was very fortunate that that is actually something that I got to work very heavily on, so that was really cool. I'm still working on it. Uh, if you haven't seen Epic, this is the building. This is actually my favorite part of the building because I like to imagine that this is like a blast shield door, like on a spaceship, and then a few more attacks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, is, this is still some outside shots. There's the inside hallway. There's our cafeteria and rock ball and all that stuff. And then here's our slides. Bath is waiting for the second floor of the first floor. <laughs> it's actually a sad story. It actually got nerfed because, you know, apparently people hurt themselves on these things. <laughs> it used to launch you. Now it's a little bit slower. Um, <laughs> this is why I can't nice things. So I, I could gush about my letters all day long in case you have a way to tell I don't know. I vowed that I would confine it to one slide because we're not here all day. Uh, the autonomy that they give all their employees is fantastic, right? They actually expect the gameplay programmers to have a bit of like gameplay design them also. So it's not like, hey, go do this, because we said so, right? You get an active involvement. Like I, I think this would be best. What if we did this instead? Uh, I want to work on this, right? And that is just so awesome, right? Like it gets you so into your job. You can also, working with the engine and the engine team is fantastic, right? How many people get to work in a place where, like, you make this engine that powers all these games, and you can go talk to all of those engineers, like, well, why did you do it this way? How come you're doing that? So, like, oh, what if we had this feature? Or if you really think about it, you add the feature yourself, and now like tons of licensees are using it, and like that's just fantastic. But most important to me is the people. First off, I consider most of them wizards. Right, that, the people there are like crazy. They know so many things. I learn something every day. Like it's completely ridiculous. I actually don't know how the artists do nine percent of the stuff they do. Like I feel that I understand how digital art for games works, but then when they output something, I'm like, well, I don't know how to do that. So <laughs> uh, they feel like family. Even as Epic grows, it still feels like a family, and it's so awesome. And I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. I got hired in October. First Thanksgiving came along. I forgot to book a trip home. And I was like, well, that's Thanksgiving alone. I didn't even tell people I was alone. Four different people found out and invited me to their house. I had been there one month. They were like, come on over. I'm like, why wouldn't you? Like, okay, awesome. Recently, like I said, when I made this trip, I had a flu and I was feeling terrible. I was at home on a Sunday, coughing my lungs out. I get a text message from a coworker. And he's like, hey, are you still feeling sick? I'm like, yeah. Oh, okay, open your front door in 10 minutes. Shows up with chicken noodle soup. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Right. So I mean, I can't, I can't say enough. Like I just, I love it there. They're fantastic. So now, on that note, an important thing I learned: first impression and like work-life balance. So I really, especially like everyone there is so awesome, and I really wanted to show them that I, I care, right? And I want to do great things for them. I put in tons of hours voluntarily, kind of without telling anybody. Right? Like when I started. I was working like 14 to 16 hours a day. I was like, I, I've got a show that I am awesome too, and I belong here. And you know, people started telling me, they were putting me aside, like, hey, we noticed you're here a little bit too long. What are you doing? Maybe you maybe should be here. And I was like, like, you don't understand. I'm the new guy, right? Like, I gotta do this. And eventually, my current boss pulled me aside, and he gave me the marathon on Sprint Talk, and we talked about it for a long time. And I thought about it, and he finally made me realize that not only was he right, I have done this my entire life, always. Like, I have always had a work-life balance problem. I always like to throw myself into schoolwork. My high school prom was spent at a science fair in Jacksonville. Like, that's, <laughs> that's kind of how I have always like, run my life. And I realized that when he said it, and I was like just flashing back to my seats, like, oh my goodness, he's right. He's so right. <laughs> And so I knew I had to do something about it. He suggested hobbies uh, for me. That turned into singing in chorus group, learning piano, and starting taking care of myself. Because I never, I never gave myself time to be healthy. I never gave myself time for relationships or anything. And so sometimes you just need to be pulled aside. Somebody has to tell you that. You can still do an awesome job. Like just put all your effort in when you're at work. You don't have to kill yourself. Like the things will get done. 
especially when the rest of your team is also like really into it too, right? Second, time estimates are super hard, like really hard. And at school, it ends up being that, okay, well, I know this needs to get done, so I'm just going to do it. You don't really think about how long you do. Well, I took three all to finish them off. Okay. In work, that doesn't work. Because if you have to give an estimate and you're super wrong, then now like, it's crunch time because you messed the schedule. So I would really suggest you practice right now. Um, pretend you're your own producer. You don't need to do tasks. Like, I think this is going to take me eight hours. If you think it's going to take a huge amount of time, break it down into subtasks. I'm still bad at this. Like I, I keep practicing and I'm getting better. But when you actually have to realistically estimate how long something's going to take you, it's hard. So there's like so many intangible too, you know, factors. That, like I, I remember when I started, I'm like, okay, this is going to take me 12 hours, I guess. But you think of those 12 hours as I'm sitting at my desk and sitting together to it. Not I need to have a meeting about this and I need to figure out how this works and I need to go talk to this person, right? And then the hours are just like going crazy by. So you really need to practice this right now. Second, anything you can make data driven. Awesome, right? Like you should, especially programmers, right? You need to do this. It empowers your team. It frees up your engineers to do stuff. Like the more that you can let be tweakable by a designer or by a content creator, awesome, right? You get into tons of time. Uh, it's a more mature approach to development. Like a lot of people are afraid of giving the designers a key because it's like you're gonna break something. But I'm gonna tell you right now, a good designer will find a way to break the game if they want to. Like if you don't give them the tool, they will break it another way. So you might as well let them be useful and super helpful by giving them tools. The second is the uh, concept of tech debt, which is another programmer thing. What do I mean? Stuff like this. We often think, like, okay, well, I, I can't spend the extra time on this because I'm correctly right now. I'll be master for sure. You're never going to have that time. Like, priorities happen, things come up, you just won't have time to do it. And you're going to, this is one of those things that will eventually gain your reputation, right? Because you're not, you're not going to have time to go back into things that are going to be in half completed states. And so it's really hard to justify this to non programmers, right? Like, imagine you're in a meeting with a producer and they're like, well, why do you want to spend time working on this thing that already works and wants to get? Oh, well, I didn't do it right the first time. Well, how come? Uh, <laughs> and like, so producers have been in the industry a long time. Like, they will understand. Like, they get it. But you still should try to avoid it. Second, uh, prototyping, obviously, is awesome, super important. Actions speak louder than words. This right here is a prime example. When I was a contractor working on the DLC, uh, one of the co op players played as a mauler, like this guy with the shield, right? He didn't really have great offensive capability because he could only do something in melee range. And I really felt like I wish that he could do something else. What if when he held the shield under reflected bullets and they bounced back? And at the time, because I was the contractor, I didn't know if I could even propose that idea. Yeah, okay. So I came in on the weekend and I did it. And I was like, I'm just going to show them. And they loved it, right? Like, they're like, wow, awesome, in the game, just like that. And so Fortnite, there are at least three or four major features of Fortnite when it shifts that are exclusively because People thought this would be an awesome idea, and I'm going to show people how awesome it is. Sometimes it's easier than just trying to convince people, right? You just come in and do it. Um, iteration, you, you basically don't embrace it. Like, it's a part of game development, it's all over the place. You, you're going to work on things that you've worked on before over and over and over and over again. You're not going to get rid of it. And more than you think. Like, so this is this is a picture from Fortnite showing kind of the, the player building system. Like, players are building this huge portal all over the place. I worked on this enough to give an entire GDC talk strictly on the early iterations. Like, we went over it so many times. It's still not done. I'm going to go back home and we're going to do more like that. Right? Like, take how much time you think it's going to take, double it, and it's probably double that. It also shows a lot of maturity when you can accept that you have to do this, right? And so, like, uh, something one of our designers said, you have to accept the change doesn't equal failure, right? The first idea is not perfect. Uh, it's going to obviously, that doesn't mean you fail. It doesn't mean you're bad. Second, you got to expect that things are going to iterate in unexpected ways. And if you, if you hang yourself on, like, this is absolutely how it has to be, because that's how it grew up the first time, you're just going to cause heartache. Third, don't really be attached to anything, because if you are, the first time you work on a feature for like three weeks and then it doesn't pan out, it gets cut, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to stink, right? It's going to be sad, but you can't get hung up on that stuff. It's part of the new Now, I mentioned the conference thing. I would strongly recommend any time you have a chance to get to a conference to go. I was lucky enough to go to GDC to speak, and then I was also at DragonCon. And they were phenomenal experiences. They're super inspirational. Uh, one thing I would mention is if you do get to do a talk uh, and you're a Phi alumni, you may want to mention that on the slide. Now, I'm not saying that there is some monster alumni who would have given a talk last year and forget to mention Phi on the slide. But if such a hypothetical person existed, he would feel really terrible afterwards. So I would suggest that if you, <laughs> that you mention them in the slide. 
Uh, real quick, also, I, I kind of cheated and I borrowed some lessons from people at work because I was like, hey, you guys are more than I do, and this is kind of turning into a programmer fest. Let me know. But the first cheat I did was actually ask another programmer, ha ha! <laughs> but he, uh, this is actually from my boss, Jason. And he, you know, the concept of the best, when you appreciate that you can't always be the best at everything, that will help you kind of thing, right? And so, yes, you can still be awesome, but you shouldn't aim to be the big fish in the small pond, like I'm the best in everything, and I can do everything, and it's fantastic. Because if you surround yourself with people who are better than you and know more than you, then all you do is stand to grow and get inspiration from them, right? And that, I, that's how I feel pretty much all the way through my career. Like, I've never been what I would consider the best. I don't consider myself a superstar, like, programmer or whatever. To me, my secret is that I really enjoy working with other people, and I try to be super friendly, and I work hard. But no one is going to speak, like, you know, confuse me for the guy who goes home and writes compilers in his spare time, right? Like, it's... Uh, borrow a lesson from design. Now, I feel bad here because our system designer data provided me with like five awesome paragraphs, and maybe I can just give them to you guys separate later. Because obviously, you can't just like throw them verbatim up here. But I felt that his five paragraphs were better than my entire presentation by a quarter's magnitude. And then I was like, well, by now, give me a five paragraph, buddy. But you know, <laughs> he did, he has a, the thing he wanted to emphasize design is not actually about ideas. It's about discipline, execution, and problem solving. To him, a successful design meeting is that you solve the problem that the game has. Not that you're the idea man who gets everything that he wants. Right? And he advises that like, if you're having a hard time making a decision, just put a stake in the ground. Make an arbitrary thing. You're going to iterate on it. So if it sucks, you're eventually going to find that out. right? You're going to get somewhere. But if you start with a blank slate and can't get anywhere, and you just spin your wheels for months and don't do anything, right? you're just not doing anyone a service. Second, think of things in terms of goals instead of implementation. And always view them that way from a design perspective. Like, I know I need to do X, Y, Z, so I'm going to keep it that way. Like, implementation is going to change all the time, but if you always keep it to, like, does this implementation meet the goal that I wanted, then you don't have to worry about changing your design as much. Second, for junior or senior designers, we kind of actually talked a little bit about this throughout, but juniors notoriously guard their ideas until they're perfect, which obviously doesn't exist. I mean, that's not a thing that's going to happen when we have perfect ideas. They're less accepting of other people's ideas, and they're always worried that they're going to share bad ideas or stupid, which is not really a thing that's going to happen. Seniors know that ideas are cheap. Everyone has them. That ideas started probably from a bad one. And they share their thoughts quickly and freely because they know that's important to the creative process. <coughs> they don't worry that they're going to show up and say something stupid. Of course they are. They're going to come up with something off the top of their head. It's going to be dumb. Oh well. Uh, and then, specifically on system design, he describes his job as a system designer as intelligently solving problems in a rules based fashion. And he emphasizes like you're trying to do things on an economy of scale. So, the first system you implement, and when you put it in a system in the first place, it's super expensive to do, right? It's going to cost up front a lot. So using the itemization example, putting in a full-fledged RPG itemization system is expensive. Like, it takes a long time. But once it's in, you can make a ton of items on cheap. So he would always say, like, if somebody asked him on Star Wars to make 10 items, he would kind of frown at them, like, really? But if they were like, hey, why don't you make 10,000 items? All right, I can do it, because I have all the systems done. And then he also emphasizes people are afraid of system design because they're afraid that it will negate the quality that if you did everything by hand, you would accomplish but when you're talking on the scale of I need 100,000 items, not only will you not finish if you do them all free form, you're eventually going to fall into patterns anyway, right? Like you're just basically did the rules, but you did them yourself. Uh, real quick, so I did get promoted to be a lead, which I mentioned, and some of you guys are going to be in leadership roles too, so I will share very quickly what I've learned in leadership, which is not a lot. I have a lot to learn. But I always like this picture. Basically, if you treat it as a partnership and you're aspiring to lead people but not be their boss, it will be so much more successful, right? Like nobody wants this guy. Um, my job, pretty much as a lead, is to unblock people. I don't tell them what to do. I just get things out of their way, right? Like, hey, I could really use help with the artists. You know, they they're working on this, and you could sync us up together. That's what I do. Right? Like, I just try to make sure things aren't distracting them or help them out. Uh, just like there's no I in team, there's no I in lead either. If the team does really well, it's because the team is awesome. If the team fails, it's probably because you screwed up, right? You you don't go like, well. My team totally sucked today. All right, like that's that's not cool. That's not how like people. No one's gonna want to follow you if you do that. And then everything you do as a leader is contagious for good or ill, right? You come in and you're super motivated and yeah, this is what I'm gonna do. We're gonna do great, right? People are gonna follow that way. But if you come in and before you were a lead, right? It was you know you felt it was fine. You came in and you're like, well, space sucks and whatever. Who said that? You do that as the lead. Oh, he's gonna do it, right? You're like, well, he's right. It sucks. But eh, did you hear what he said? Right? You just can't do that. And then I will close, last thing. This I think also super important, is we like to say be a force multiplier in everything. 
What that means is like you use a little bit of your spare time when you can to help other people in some way. Like you unblock them, you do a task for them that enables their workflow to be smoother. And it only takes a little bit of time, but the amount of time it saves and the productivity gains is a multiple on how much time you actually spend. And whoops. To me, this is actually an epic secret of how they are capable of continuing to compete in a AAA marketplace that has, like my studio, like the studio has like 700 employees. We don't, we're still a small studio, right? It still feels family based. And because everyone there is trying to subscribe to this, it just happened. It's a very good example. Right when I started, we were working, there was like a, a problem with animation on the DLC. The animator was over in the corner, he was, he was like struggling with it. And I have an over here and I talked to him, I was like, what's the problem? Explained it. I was like, you know what? I bet I can fix that in code in like five minutes. He's like, really? So I went and did it, fixed it. That was going to take him hours. Saved. Not like 40 minutes later, I ran into a problem with the animation. And I'm like, oh, this is a nightmare. Like, I'm going to have to change how this is network and like all this mess to make it work. He's like, I bet I can fix that in animation. I was like, you can? And so he spent 30 minutes. Problem gets solved and probably net saved like. Eight or 16 hours if we had just stayed on our own and like not not done that interaction, but it requires that you be proactive because a lot of people aren't going to tell you because they assume you're busy. Like everyone's busy, everyone has problems. I don't want to burden you with my problems. So you need to be listening. And so another good example, right? We have a particle system editor in UB, that went in UB3, and every time they would check out, they would like edit an existing file. It didn't prompt them to check it out of per force, even though it does that everywhere else in the editor. Like that was one oversight. I heard the, the particle guy complaining about it. And I was like, what's the problem? And he explained, I was like, that takes two minutes to fix. He's like, really? I was like, yeah, and I just did it. And it saves him so much time. Like, but I would have never known that's part of his workflow because when I need the particle this matter, I'm just screwing around, right? Like, I'm not checking out existing assets. I'm like, let's change this to purple and see what happens. Oh, cool, <laughs> right? So I would have never known if I hadn't heard him in the next. So you have to be proactive. And if you're not, these people are super creative. They're going to come up with workarounds, and they're probably going to be bad, right? Like because they just want to get stuff done. So it might be a super hacky mess, and like that is festering, and you go nowhere. Uh, last thing is so like there's a picture. This is from an XKCD comic of like how long could you work on something on a task, making it more efficient before you spent more time than it was worth, right? And down here they have like if you have a task that's 50 times a day is done and you shave five minutes off of it, you could technically work on it for nine months and it's still like efficient, right? Imagine you just did that for 50 artists simultaneously, right? Like that is ridiculous. And all it took was a little bit of your time. Now the danger is you can't have all of your time and offline doing this, like, cause you're, it, it gets addictive, right? Cause people are like, oh yes, yes, thanks, so helpful. And you're like, I just wanna help people all day long. And then you don't do your own stuff. And then you end up staying late cause you're like, oh yeah, I actually have work to do. So what I like to do, is I keep a notepad that has my, my tasks, and I have a section that I call like the little five minute, like little bucket list. And if somebody says something and they complain, I'm like, this could be better or whatever, I put it on there, and then I like start dragging them around relative to like how fast I think they can do it and how important they are. And I'll tell them, like, I can't promise you right now, but when I have spare time, like somebody compiled or whatever, I'll take a look at it. And they're like, okay. And then I do it, like, and I just submit it. And it, it takes five or 10 minutes of my time here or there when I have spare time, like I'm rebuilding a solution or whatever, and get it done. It's great. Now, I realize I wasted, or not wasted, but I used a ton of time, so I don't know how much time you guys will actually have for questions. I will be happy to answer anything you want, but I do ask that you respect that there will be some things that I probably won't be able to say. Like, I'm not going to tell you a ton about Fortnite, for example, right? But we'll gladly answer anything you would like to ask me questions. So we know we have our artists uh, leaving us at one, so uh, let's just take a, a couple questions, and then we'll take Billy. So, uh, questions? How do we get that five paragraphs from the designer? I will make sure that I send it to Ron or okay. like you have them. But thank you. Yep. Anything else? I got a question if you don't. <laughs> okay. So um with regards to Epic, is there something about uh, your experience there, your role there, that you'd say you um, you struggled with early on, but you improved over your time period? Um, probably a lot of different things. Like, like the one that I gave you as an example is like the work life balance. Absolutely, right. That was really bad at the beginning. Um, that concept of the force multiplier, I definitely let it go out of control for a while. Like, I was just like four hours. Let's help everybody. We got this, <laughs> right? 
was like, oh, okay, now, now I'm back to the work-life balance is disrupted because now I have to commit on the weekends. So it sounds like it might be valuable to have someone as with that as their role. Like they don't have other work. No, their work is improving the efficiency of everyone else. Right. It's worth it. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, that's come up, and maybe something we will check into is like actually somebody on our team brought it up again. They're like, there's so many like little one-off things, and like we don't want to keep asking the same people over and over. Yeah. Like, what if one person was different? It, it always comes down to like the engineering, like I said, is always a scrap, so it's always a hard justification, but then it is super valuable. So. It sounds like you, you almost have this conflict within yourself in the sense that you love doing game play, you want to do game play, but you also love helping other people to be more efficient. So Yes, yeah, I, I would say that's, that's fair. <laughs> so, do you feel like if you had learned your work life balance less than five years earlier, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have gotten as far? So that's actually a hard question like, that I actually think about a lot. And that's, that's part of the reason why, like when I mentioned it, I didn't say I regret it, mm -hmm. right? Because it's hard to know what would have happened. I mean, at the time, like, I went walkers kind of, right? And I, I tried so hard. And so I, I can't tell you with 100% that maybe not. But I also, like, if it's not regret, I, I do recognize, looking back, that there are like, a lot of things that I, I missed out on, right? Because it's like, so it's a balance thing. Like, what, what is more important to me at the time? Right? So I, I could have spent more time with my family. I could have met somebody or you're right, because instead I was like working until two in the morning, right? So I can't say for certain, but I would like to think so. Because when I am at work, like I stay as focused as conceivable as possible and I work super hard. And so I like to think that the reputation thing would still come through even if I didn't like go bananas. I can't promise. That. <laughs> well great. Well let's thank Billy for joining us. I'll send you guys the, the slides if I'm able to, if I'm able to release those back here.